Good morning, good day, and good evening to you wherever you are, and a very, very warm welcome to this month's edition of Schumacher Conversations. My name is Sebastian Wood, and I am your host today. Our conversation will last around 90 minutes, and I will try and keep us to the agenda. After I have told you a bit about me and the series, I will introduce today's conversation and our speakers. Each of the speakers will then do a 10 minute presentation, which will be followed by a discussion. And then we will move on to questions for the speakers from all of you before closing remarks and some information on our next conversation in August. So a bit about me, I am here today in my capacity as a board director of the Schumacher Center. In my spare time, I run an engineering consultancy, Whitby Wood, which I co-founded with my business partner, Mark Whitby. I like to think we practice engineering as if people mattered, but today's talks might show that to be an aspiration rather than a reality. My grandfather, Fritz Schumacher, who I know as Pop, died six months after I was born. I know him only through my family's stories, particularly my mother's, of someone utterly unique with a titanic intellect, a great sense of humour, but crucially the compassion and wisdom of someone altogether much more spiritual. My reflection, my personal reflection on what I know of Pop and of his writing, particularly Small is Beautiful, is that this unique combination of personal ingredients in, is what enabled him to give something that is in very short supply in today's world, and that is hope. Real hope, not wishful thinking, practical, decent, human scale ideas that give us all hope for, a better, for better lives and a better world. Today, we have three speakers who all exude this critical ingredient of a sustainable and equitable world, hope. All three practicing work that give us all hope that this future is not only possible, but here today. Before introducing our speakers, I'd like to briefly tell you about this conversation series and today's topic. First of all, about the Schumacher Center. Founded in 1980, the Schumacher Center for a New Economics works to envision the elements of a just and regenerative global economy, undertakes to apply these elements in its home region of the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts, and then develops the educational programs to share the results more broadly, thus encouraging replication. 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of E.F. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful. This 50th anniversary is the Schumacher Center's opportunity to advance solutions that build on Schumacher's vision. Central to the 2023 celebrations are this month's series convening new economic thinkers, builders, and activists to share their latest insights and advance common paths forward. 2023's Schumacher Conversations bring together change makers from a range of fields whose work today is actively shaping a small is beautiful future, focused around key themes and fields of activism. Each online conversation charts actionable pathways towards a just regenerative planet. So today's uh, theme of developing convivial technologies for right livelihood. Small is Beautiful advocated an economics in which both people and planet truly matter. At the heart of my grandfather's economic analysis is the issue of technological gigantism. The fact that conventional industrialization had and has resulted in ever larger mechanization and ever increasing complexity at the expense of intangible values, community cohesion, local self-reliance, and workers' sense of agency and satisfaction in their labor. Appropriate technology is technology designed to work at human scale. The main goals of the appropriate technology movement are to enhance local self-reliance and to harmonize economic activity with ecological health. Its emphasis 
on simple to adopt solutions that empower rather than displace creative and meaningful labor. Alongside Ivan Ilk's contemporary tools for conviviality, Small is Beautiful catalyzed a broad international discussion and an array of practical innovation in this emerging field. Today, appropriate technologies may be found supporting transitions towards small scale renewable energy, manufacturing and regenerative agriculture. Today's panelists are those championing elegant technological solutions in both underdeveloped as well as overdeveloped contexts. Together, their ingenuity illustrates the importance of a middle way in economic development, placing efficiency among a more holistic set of human values to encourage more convivial societies. And so to our panelists. John Chettleborough is Agriculture and Markets Lead with Practical Action, the NGO set up by Fritz Schumacher in 1966, originally called the Intermediate Technology Group. His current portfolio supports local-led regenerative, ag regenerative agriculture in Africa, Asia, Asia and Latin America. Dawn Cox is the Research Director for the Wolf's Neck Centre for Agriculture and the Environment in Freeport, Maine, and farms with his family on 250 acres in Lee, New Hampshire. He is a founder of the Farm OS software platform and FarmHack, and is active in the soil health movement. And lastly, Toby Hammond is the co-founder and managing director of Future Pump, a leading manufacturer of solar irrigation pumps designed for one acre smallholder farmers, mostly in the global south, displacing gasoline powered water pumps. Welcome to you all. And so uh, the next section is uh, about 30 minutes and it will be each of our speakers giving their opening individual remarks. And I'd like to first invite John to do so. John, over to you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, and thank you on behalf of Patrick Action, thank you for inviting us to um, participate in this session. <laughs> I think I should probably start by saying a little bit about practical action so people understand the context context on which I'm speaking. Um, as you mentioned, we were set up in 1966 by Fritz Schumacher. We were originally called the Intermediate Technology Development Group, and we were set up to put his ideas into practice in, in what was then called the developing world. So we're now a global organization with offices in nine countries across Africa, Asia, and South America. And we have six decades of what you could call practical problem solving experience, uh, working with communities to develop solutions that support sustainable agriculture, access to energy, and um, that support communities, um, that protect communities from extreme climatic events, and that promote uh, improved water and sanitation. So our approach is to work is a bit like the way you described the work of the Schumacher uh, Center for New Economics. We work with communities to demonstrate what works. And then we work with other organizations such as funders and donors uh, to scale that up. So a big change, we're starting from, uh, from small work with, with communities. But our work and our approaches haven't been static since 1966. They've been constantly evolving as, as we've been learning and, and as the world around us has changed. So we don't look the same as we looked in 1966 or even in 1986. Um, and in fact, if you, if you looked at us back then, we were full of quite hardcore engineers and technicians. Someone told me recently it used to be quite a macho place to, to, to work. Now we're much more soft around the edges. Um, we're full of people with more of a holistic background. So I'm a market system specialist, stroke uh, social scientist, stroke general geographer. So there's been lots of changes in the organization since it was formed. And one of those changes has been how we approach and how we see technology. So we've basically been on this journey, and that journey is what I'm going to I'm going to talk about. Um, so, like like most journeys, we should start at the beginning. So, um, as, as you were saying, Sebastian, your grandfather spoke about technology. He spoke about the importance of technology that supported self reliance, and that meant tools that were made by local communities, that were made from local resources, um, that could be maintained locally, that were simple. To, to use and that could be controlled by local communities and of course that were good for the environment and you can see those principles in a lot of the work 
that we've done in the past. And I would like to share my screen to show some um, to show some pictures now. OK, so, so this picture, um, this picture is from the, the 1980s. It shows a donkey plough introduced in Sudan, uh, introduced in Sudan. So the ploughs were manufactured by local blacksmiths. The harnesses were made from local materials. It was very, very simple technology and um, had a transformational impact on the lives of, of, of women who um, were, were ploughing fields. It massively reduced the drudgery and it led to significant increases uh, in, in crop yields. So this is another picture from uh, Sudan, and it shows uh, locally made zeer pots. The zeer pots are basically a small pot inside a big pot. Um, between the two pots is sand, which is full of water. Um, the, the water evaporates, which reduces the temperature. It releases latent energy, which reduces the temperature in the small pot, and that helps preserve food for a number of weeks, which can have a significant, make a significant contribution to, to local household uh, food security and nutrition. So this next picture shows um, floating a floating garden in Bangladesh. Now I'm sure many people are familiar with the problem of flooding in Bangladesh. Um, it, it can flood farmland, which makes it difficult for people to grow crops. So an innovative solution are these floating gardens. They're basically rafts made out of water hyacinth and bamboo. And, and people grow um, food crops, which again, make a significant contribution to uh, food security and nutrition. So these type of initiatives are, are classic ITDG uh, initiatives, and they really fit the definition of appropriate technology from Small is Beautiful. Um, but since it, the book was published, the, the world has changed uh, immeasurably. We now have a food system that is destroying the planet through unsustainable agriculture, and environmental degradation to a degree that I think Schumacher couldn't have envisioned in, in his worst nightmares. And alongside that, we have a climate crisis which is deepening those problems and which is undermining the progress against poverty that has been made. And small scale farmers are particularly affected. So I was recently in, in Rwanda, where we have a pro project that supports small scale tea farmers to diversify. And the rains there have always been variable and farmers have always had to cope with variable rains, but they're getting so variable now that farmers really have difficulty, difficulty in knowing what to plant and when to plant it. In other parts of Africa, the problem is, is flooding, which is destroying farmland. In other parts, such as some of the areas we work in Kenya, climate change has, has got to the point where agriculture is becoming unviable and people are actually migrating away. So Schumacher said, if we squander our fossil fuels, we threaten civilization. And when you look at the impacts of climate change today, those words are really coming back to haunt us. And I think that to deal with this situation, we now find ourselves in more than ever, we need what Schumacher was advocating for. More than ever, we need that economic de uh, development that works for people and the planet that, that Sebastian mentioned at the beginning. More than ever, we need sustainability, adaptability and collaboration. But to achieve that, in practical action, we've come to the conclusion that it needs a different response from us to the responses that we've uh, used in the past. We now need solutions that deal with a variety of different interconnected challenges, and we need solutions that allow us to get to, to, get to higher levels of scale. And that has all had an impact on how we view and approach technology. So there's two significant differences to how we approach technology that I really want to, to emphasize. The first is that the technology isn't necessarily locally made. Advances in manufacturing mean that all sorts of technology are now affordable to local, communi to local communities and can be um, produced at scale, such as these future pumps um, from Toby's company. Um, this is a picture from a project in Malawi. And that's quite a good example because the provision of affordable, decentralized renewable energy really can be a game changer small scale farmers, helping them cope with climate change and also helping address the problem of poverty. So it can enable irrigation that allows, allows farmers to cope with 
um, the, the, uh, the, the unreliable rainfall. It can support local processing that allows um, farmers to generate more revenue and allows that revenue to be kept in the communities in which the food production takes place. It can support improved storage, which reduces post-harvest losses and enables uh, better market access. And it's technology that is simple to use, which can be controlled by local communities. And that's particularly important for marginalised groups, such as the women in this photograph, who for, for a long time have, have struggled to gain access to technology. We, um, we recently asked women, women farmers in this project what, how they felt about things. And one of the, the women, a, a lady called Lydia, said, knowing that I will own the greenhouse and the pump just makes me feel happy because we've never owned equipment before. So very much in line with, with Schumacher, but as the technology is not locally made and it's not from local resources, it doesn't quite tick every box. Um, but Schumacher did say that you shouldn't be fundamentalist about the principles of Small is Beautiful. They should be adapted to suit local specific context. And I think this is an example of that sort of adaptation. The second change in how we think about technology is that if changes happen at scale, a focus on the technology alone is not enough. There's a number of other challenges that need to be taken into account. And let me just give you a few photographs to illustrate what I mean. So for instance, if it's not locally produced, there needs to be some way for the technology to be distributed at scale. So to meet that challenge, you need market models that provide technology at fair prices to all communities. This picture shows a small business that sells solar products to hard to reach communities. So these are communities that previously would have been ignored by dominant economic models and we should, would have been denied access to this, this sort of technology. Then there's the challenge of agri agricultural markets. So if agricultural markets do not work for small scale farmers, then the introduction of technology isn't going to help them develop a viable livelihood. And in fact, if, if, if the agricultural markets don't work, farmers won't be able to earn enough to afford to buy um, the technology in the first place. And too often markets work for big farmers and, and, and big companies and not for small farmers. And that really needs to shift. This picture shows um, a farmer in uh, Bolivia who was part of a project that supported the strengthening of cooperatives so that they could get more sales and better prices uh, from buyers. And then there's a challenge of production. So to, to take advantage of market opportunities, small farmers need to be able to improve production in a sustainable way. And for that to happen, there needs to be a support system that provides knowledge and incentives that enable regenerative agriculture. So this picture shows a farmer in Kenya who has introduced regenerative and circular farming practices and is supported to do that through a network of public and private extension providers. So for appropriate technology to make the difference it can make, we need to go beyond tools alone we need to address many of these sort of interrelated challenges and we need to find ways to, to achieve scale. And the way we talk about that shift in our thinking and practical action is we've moved away from a focus purely on technology to a more holistic focus on the systems that enable appropriate development to take place. And you can see that shift in the sort of programmes we now support. And I'd just like to finish off with a few photographs uh, of some programmes that demonstrate that. So this is um, this is a picture from Malawi. This shows a group of a group of women farmers outside a solar uh, refrigerated plant, which is owned by a social enterprise. So the social enterprise uh, trains the women on agriculture. Um, it stores the tomatoes they grow in the chill plant, and it sells them on to the market. And the women produce the tomatoes using the pumps that I described before uh, and greenhouses. And they pay for the pumps and the greenhouses through what's called a rent to own, a rent to own model. And, and the thing about this, this model is it's not just about access to technology. This is also a, a model, it's a business, social business model that strengthens the capacity of a women's cooperative. And it, it provides a solution to access to markets and access to inputs. And access, to and access to technology. So it addresses multiple problems and not just, not just the access to, um, to technology, sorry. And, um, 
And it's also a business model. So a fundamental part of this is that we hope that the, the, the social enterprise concerned can go away and can scale up this uh, in, in other areas. And even the other businesses can potentially take this and scale it up in other areas. This is a picture of a farmer in Senegal accessing information on good farming practices through a radio. So the same program actually also uses mobile phones to distribute uh, information. Now you could argue that this is a bit similar to the donkey plow example. It's about a technology, it's, a, it's just about a more advanced uh, technology. But the difference is that this was part of a project that involved government, the private sector and civil society. And it was done in response to the fact that access to information, the systems for it were not working effectively. So what you're looking at is actually a system that will improve access to information then which will be carried, up, carried on by local, by local organizations. And of course, one of the benefits of using this sort of technology is that it can be scaled up. So this program actually reached over 800,000 uh, farmers with messages. And my last photo, that, so the photos on the right, um, there's a number of photos. They show a farmer using vermiculture and hydroponics. They show some local traders and they show a meeting that brought together different farmers, businesses, finance institutions, government and others. And they're all from a current project in Kenya which is promoting regenerative agriculture and youth opportunities uh, in agriculture. Now, I was one of the facilitators in the workshop that first brought together these, these different stakeholders, and it was probably the most exciting thing I've done in my time in practical action. The purpose of the workshop was to bring together stakeholders so they, they could work together to identify the challenges affecting, in this case, it was the poultry sector, and they could identify ways in which they could collaborate. And the, the trust what was developed during that workshop the, the appetite for collaboration and the energy was just very, very inspiring and, and very much, I think, in line with what Schumacher would have called locally led development. And this project is leading to changes in how things are done. It's leading, it's created new types of extension provision. It's uh, supported small scale businesses that provide organic fertilizer and feedstuffs. It's created market opportunities for agricultural produce. And it's led to sig a significant increase in the numbers of farmers practicing regenerative agriculture. Now technology is part of all of that and that includes solar technology like we talked about before and it also includes more local technology such as the vermiculture example here. But what's exciting about this initiative and why I wanted to finish on this one is that what you're starting to see and, and it is early days but what you're starting to see is a system in which there are incentives for different actors for government, for the private sector, for farmers incentives to adopt a different form of economic development, one that is good for the planet and good for people. And I think that type of systems change is truly exciting because that's when you really see how we can achieve scale. And that's when you really start to see how we can achieve Schumacher's vision. So in all those examples of our current work, I think you can still see Schumacher's principles. You can still see the role of appropriate technology, although it doesn't drive our work like it did in the past, but it does still play an important role in, uh, in creating big change that starts small. So I'll finish there. I'll finish with our logo, which will make our marketing folks happy. So on that note, I'll pass back to you, Sebastian. John, thank you very, very much indeed. And lots of, lots of food for thought for questions later, hopefully from our audience. Um, in, perhaps you could unshare your screen and I will now go on to Dawn um, who uh, will, do his opening remarks. Dawn, over to you. John, if you could unshare your screen, that'd be great. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, uh, Sebastian and uh, John for that great introduction. Um, my name is Doran Cox uh, and I'm, as you said, research director, but I really uh, wanted to acknowledge, at research director at Wolf's Neck Center for Agriculture and the Environment, but I really wanted to acknowledge again, the influence of Small and Beautiful on our own family operation. It was, it was on our bookshelf. It was embodied in, I think, everything in the farm that I grew up on, which has been so, uh, continues to be uh, so influential in uh, developing our local food systems and really inspiring a lot of the work uh, that, uh, that I'll talk about uh, today um, and including my uh, graduate research work, uh, which is again, the foundation of a lot of the community organizations uh, that I've uh, had the pleasure of uh, helping to uh, co-found um, and recently uh, acknowledged the influence in a recent book uh, just came out uh, 
that I authored, uh, The Great Regeneration, Ecological Agriculture, Open Technology, and the Radical Vision of Hope. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, I, I'm a co-founder of organizations like uh, uh, such as FarmHack and FarmOS, um, but those are, re I really want to acknowledge that those were built on uh, uh, on the efforts of others and really represent, uh, looking to represent the work of earlier open source ag, which really goes back to the, the you know, as, as, as old as the history of agriculture and, and sharing seeds, that, that ability to share the uh, local innovation with, with others uh, and uh, recognizing that agriculture uh, and knowledge sharing is a multi-generational shared human endeavor. And we're seeing the importance of that even more uh, so now when we've so radically affected the climate and really highlighting that we're in this together uh, and that it's, uh, it, it is really a, a, a deep human desire uh, and, uh, and help and defines who we are with each other and with the environment. The way in which we conduct agriculture as a, and the tools we use are a reflection of us and our understanding of the world and how we relate to each other. And so that's really foundational, I think, in terms of thinking about the kinds of organizations that we're building to reflect that. Um, and so, you know, FarmHack was uh, really based on uh, using uh, open, so other open source initiatives that had developed software that allows us to communicate more broadly and efficiently in more detail to communicate essentially those blueprints, that DNA of ideas, information, inspiration that can translate into tools uh, that can be built anywhere. And we have different ways of doing that and essentially asking the question, uh, how might we use those tools together uh, to share our global knowledge, but apply it locally and create that same sort of sovereignty in, in the tools that we're, we're developing. Um, and not just, uh, and I, I want to make the point that, uh, that a lot of the tools, they, it includes the, the tools that we use, that we often think about in terms of tools, in terms of the hardware we use in the field, uh, you know, cedars or no-till, you know, no-till drills or uh, roller crimpers or other sorts of innovations uh, that can be manufactured locally, but also uh, that the tools in communication and analysis and observation are equally important in how we share that information, how we use them, because the tool by itself is only part of what makes that effective. It's that cultural knowledge about how to actually not only manufacture it, but how to actually use it appropriately. And increasingly, we're seeing with regenerative agriculture that uh, the limitation is not sort of the, the inputs, but really the knowledge of natural systems. And that's really about communicating, again, how, how we understand the plants, what we do where and how and what works where, and harnessing this common of uh, genetic diversity we have globally where plants grow anywhere. There are plants that have adapted to grow everywhere. And how do we equip everyone everywhere with the knowledge to grow food and create sovereignty in their community everywhere? And that is both sort of highlights this dilemma that we have or tension that we have in agriculture and managing our global sort of climate is that it's both we're, we're sharing knowledge in the commons and it's also an intensely place-based and individual enterprise uh, that, that is balancing sovereignty with large-scale collaboration. Um, but I think fundamentally we have, we're at a unique moment in history where we have tools to collaborate globally and protect our, our sovereignty in that process. Uh, and we're, we're, we're certainly seeing the downside in terms of social media and what happens when we don't take control over that situ situation. Um, but ultimately the, you know, the work and the organizations uh, that are represented uh, by FarmHack and FarmOS are really how do we cross pollinate and build on each other's work um, I, I think it is, Howard Buffett said, is each individual has 40 seasons to learn, but if we connect with another thousand individuals, we have 40,000 seasons uh, to accelerate our, our learning. And that's sort of the equation that I think is really uh, in, important here. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, you know, 
farm hack built on efforts like the you know the the encyclopedia uh, the sort of the french version of, in, of the wikipedia for farm knowledge and saying well, how do we bring that in uh to replicate that in in uh with our current uh information technology um but from that we've actually and that really focused on sharing hardware uh concepts uh, but from that we've really focused again on this knowledge exchange piece and uh, built other organizations like the gathering for open ag tech uh, which is tied in which was really inspired by some of the large-scale open science hardware work uh global collaborations and concern the gathering for open science hardware uh, and more recently, we've been scaling up with an initiative called Open Team or Open Tech Ecosystem for Agricultural Management, uh, which is a collaborative of, uh, of research universities and government agencies and food companies and farmer organizations of all scales um, uh, and foundations uh, to translate and, and explore what does it look like to actually create a collaborative environment for multi-generate a multi-generational shared endeavor uh, to advance or and understand harness the tools that have been used to observe the, uh, and uh, and destroy the environment and what does it look like to uh, to redeploy those because there we've seen the incredible power of those same tools, satellite imagery and remote sensing and a and AI and all those things that are having this profoundly and and the me the mechanisms to actually degrade the environment. How do we take those same tools and redeploy them? We've used them to measure that degradation. How do we start to uh, use them to measure regeneration? Um, so again, we see the dangers in some of the tech that doesn't really represent that uh, small scale. And I think part of the question we're asking is how do we uh, uh, look at the, this, the, the global uh, knowledge and technology ecosystem that is doing this harm? And what are the ways in which we can uh, change the governance or, around that um, to, uh, to create agency? And it, to some extent, even if it's, it, 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 to some extent, it's not an option. Uh, we it actually is is imperative because if we don't control that system, it is already controlling our outcomes. Um, and re harness that to uh, into structures that rather than leave it to uh, as a byproduct of a private enterprise, really look at it uh, from uh, a, a service, a knowledge utility. Uh, to help serve our commonwealth and really recognize that 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 common knowledge uh, uh, in terms of our seeds, our breeds, our technologies, uh, and the ideas and information are part of that commons that we can manage. And I think this really builds on the original FAO vision, which again, coming back to Schumacher, uh, was really inspired by some of that appropriate technology coming out of out of India. And the way, how do we document and create uh, the 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 that uh, that common commonwealth of uh, tools and access to information. Um, and during that period, of course, uh, they were limited to pamphlets and printing presses. And now we have a, a, a lot more uh, potential power al along those sides. So it's really about, again, uh, linking this global knowledge to local production and food sovereignty uh, is uh, not, uh, and, and I guess the other sort of key aspect uh, um, here is that we have with communications technologies now not only the ability to share uh, different means of production but also starting to recognize that we have alternative modes of exchange and reciprocity that can be built uh, into that system that's what open source software is built on is essentially a reciprocity and a gift economy uh, essentially but with attribution and so those are really key aspects that we think are really important uh, as we're building out and scaling um, uh, and intentionally um, and culturally uh, you know assimilating I, I think the 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 thing that's been disorienting for me growing up uh, uh, you know on the farm using tech and fabricating tools and technology and being so involved on the information technology side is I see that it's easy to be that it's a distraction. And I think that it's 
and and yet it it is part of our our world and and has the potential i think to transcend the use of the technology to a point where we can culturally assimilate into cultural practices our understanding of these tools and move again back to um, more uh, uh, other ways of knowledge exchange. Um, so I'll, I'll close, I guess, with uh, again, echoing that the tools themselves are not sufficient. We need to create them with the incentives and the skills and then successful examples. But part of doing that is actually using our communications tools to do, to do that, to create that social and technical uh, environment and creating uh, um, uh, appropriate uh, oaths of care and ethical social contracts related to the use of technology. I think that's a really important thing that we've been developing within uh, Open Team and working with organizations to begin to create uh, shared community documents and social contracts because we think it's an ethical uh, that like doctors uh, have a Hippocratic oath or uh, fiduciaries and financial management, we think that the, uh, the development of technology has a, a key social aspect to it. So we're actually asking our members within each of these groups to co-draft and create these oaths and contracts, but then sign on to them. Um, and again, finally, to sort of bring it around, I think the other key thing as we're thinking about agriculture and enterprises that are built on the technology. I really like the uh, metaphor that uh, um, that Marquita Mirabeau used, a, a, an early land-based economist uh, in 1700s in France, uh, thought of uh, or, or used the tree metaphor where agriculture is at the roots and uh, society is, at, is the trunk and that arts and commerce are at the leaves and branches and that the competition is at the leaves and branches. You can have two branches that are competing with one another um, and, and, and that can coexist while recognizing that we're all actually needing to grow the whole and the, the agriculture and our understanding of that is at the root. So they're the things that we do collaboratively and cooperatively and the things that we compete. And they're not, uh, all, they're not, uh, intention, they're really complementary to one another. And we also know that when there's, uh, in, in the uh, quote from Marquis de Birabeau, that when you have a, uh, a storm, you may lose your leaves and branches, they may, but they're able to regrow. But if we lose our roots, we lose the, our ability to, to, uh, uh, to regrow effectively. So I, I think that's a, that to me is a very helpful sort of uh, approach as we're thinking about this balance between public and private enterprises and how we see, uh, how they balance one another. Um, so thanks for the time. Uh, I, I know it was not it, it was uh, uh, to and to take this opportunity to to uh, uh, present in a higher level uh, way than I normally get to uh, and and acknowledge the real inspiration and importance that uh, uh, that uh, small and beautiful uh, provided in in our in our own work. John, thank you very much indeed uh, for those uh, comments and those thoughts. Um, uh, a lot, a lot to chew over there. Um, lastly, uh, before we move on to some conversation, I'd like to invite Toby uh, to uh, uh, make some initial remarks as well. Um, Toby, over to you. Thanks, Seb. Um, so what I'm going to do is is just very quickly tell our story, really, about um, what future, where Future Pump came from and what we do, um, rattle through a few pictures, um, and then um, hopefully get on to the, the more interesting uh, question time bit um, after that. Um, so, I mean, for me personally, this whole journey began Funnily enough, when I um, when I met Seb, uh, our chairman here, uh, some twenty years ago, we both actually studied at a, a master's course in London on sustainable development and looking at these um, ideas of how you can achieve social environmental impact as well as um, a, a financially sustainable business. And um, and shortly after that, um, someone else offered me the chance to ride to Africa on a bicycle, um, which isn't an offer you get every day. I couldn't really think of a good idea why, why I would say no. I couldn't, couldn't think of any excuse. So although I'm no athlete whatsoever, I um, spent eight months cycling to 
Johannesburg in South Africa. But for me, that was a kind of a, a defining life change moment because I saw from my saddle um, so much of what was going on with small scale farming um, and the, the lives of um, people living on that continent. And, and that, that stayed with me and stayed with me um, to this day. Um, so um, if I fast forward a little bit um, to a time in uh, 2011 when I'd actually had another company in renewable energy and which, where I'd been uh, really screwed over by some venture capitalists actually and I, I was sitting at my desk feeling a bit sore about this and um, for some reason found myself on YouTube um, and on YouTube I found, I'm not quite sure how, uh, this, this picture of this solar powered water pump and so you don't have to look at me for uh, the next few minutes. I'm going to share my screen now and show you a picture um, of what I saw um, on that day. Uh, and I think uh, it is this one. Let's see if that works. Yeah. Is that working? I can't actually see whether you can see. It's funny. Could you give me a thumbs up, Seb, if you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so this contraption here is actually a, 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 a solar steam pump. Um, it's built on 300 year old principles of, of steam engines. It, I found it completely captivating. Um, and um, I guess you could say this is intermediate technology. Um, it certainly um, doesn't involve a lot of, uh, of modern technology. I got in touch with the inventor um, who very generously said, oh, I'm just a lowly engineer. I really were looking for someone to help um, scale and commercialize this. Now this technology actually turned out to be pretty wacky. I have to say, um, as, as you can see, it, it has a sort of parabolic dish which concentrates the, the sun. And uh, if you're lucky not to be blinded by that, it can uh, it, it then boils some water and drives the pump. So it wasn't long before we realized that um, solar PV panels would be a, a better way of doing it. Um, and, and so really started the journey of, of Future Pump, which is the company I co-founded um, round about um, 10 years ago, and our journey into yeah, into, into, into building um, intermediate technology. And uh, John's actually, in our first speaker, John has already done a rather good job of, uh, of selling uh, what we do uh, at Future Pump. Um, so that was very kind of him. But I'm just gonna flick through um, a few slides, which will give you kind of a flavor of, of, of what we do. Um, and then we can get on to um, the, the, the questions after that, hopefully. Um, so here, is, um, here, is, here are some of our customers. Um, who are, are based in Zambia. The reason we set up Future Pump is that in Africa alone, 80% of the food that is consumed is actually um, grown by smallholder farmers. And nearly all of that food is reliant on the rainfalls. Um, and as other speakers have said, those rainfalls are not um, reliable anymore, unfortunately. And the, the rains, um, uh, you can no longer set your watch by the rains as you used to. Um, but the potential for impact here, and this is, you know, going back to my, my studies in sustainability, impact is what we're interested in here. There, there are some, by some estimates, around half a billion, 500 million smallholder farmers in the world. Um, and about one in five of those, we think, so 100 million, could really improve and transform their incomes by irrigating. irrigating. Um, and in, in Kenya alone, that, we think that constitutes over... Um, a million farmers who could irrigate. Um, but the next slide really shows you what tends to go on. Mostly what happens is people make for the, wait for the rains. Um, but some farmers, such as the, the lady on the left here, um, will try and irrigate with buckets, um, which you can imagine is, is probably on the, um, uh, on the Fritz Schumacher scale. That's the $1 technology. Um, and you know, that isn't that isn't going to lift anyone out of poverty um, doing what this lady is attempting here. Of course, the alternative um, is is to use uh, gasoline, um, diesel, petrol pumps um, with the obvious drawbacks of, of of cost and carbon emissions and nasty fumes and things like that. Um, so I won't do too much of a sales pitch here, but we think we have perfected a range of solar pumps um, which use the, the power of the sun. Um, to to achieve that same aim to irrigate um, to irrigate crops um, so that farmers can increase their incomes feed their families and become more locally sustainable 
Um, now, one of the big things um, about our design philosophy, and these come from the inventor that I referred to earlier, who posted the early um, technology on, on YouTube, is that they're simple. Our pumps are really, really deliberately simple, and we, we're not offended at all if someone describes our products as basic um, or, or, or something like that. They're designed to be. In fact, we have found that making something simple is much, much harder than making something complicated. Um, and our, our, our design has always been about taking away features uh, and parts and simplifying um, so that we can have a very, very robust um, pump which will last uh, and can be locally serviced and maintained for many years and we do offer a 10 year warranty. Okay, I've already covered that bit. Um, we've sold um, about 16,000 of these in case you're wondering um, in the last 10 years, mostly in the last few years. Um, and we've, we've sold those right across um, Africa and Asia through a network of, of distributors. And the, in, the impact that we typically have found um, is that um, there's, a sa there's a saving of around $300 a year um, through avoided um, fuel or labor costs. And the farmers who are most au fait with what they should be growing and what the local market prices are for particular crops, um, in some cases have tripled their income by adopting irrigation, by adopting solar powered irrigation in, uh, in this case. And at this point, I'm going to deviate a little from the, uh, the theme of simplicity by mentioning that we do have remote monitoring gadgets on some of our pumps, um, which is a bit high tech for, uh, for Schumacher's tastes, but it does tell us uh, uh, quite a lot about the impact of which we're so interested in, in monitoring um, about how our pumps are used and where they are. Um, okay, so um, here are just some more pictures of nice farmers with pumps. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our factory next, because um, I was expecting to have to um, argue here that um, locally made production isn't necessarily the panacea, because that is really the, the ideology that I took from, um, from Small is Beautiful. And, uh, and once again, John's already made that argument for me quite compellingly that um, you know, one shouldn't be uh, too, too ideological about it, and there are exceptions to that. Now, in our case, um, although we did try local uh, manufacture of our pump in the early days, we quickly realized that if we were going to scale our impact across uh, continents, then we needed to focus our energies on one manufacturing location where we could drive down the costs and drive up the quality. Um, and this is a picture of um, our purpose-built factory, which is in the state of Gujarat in Western India. Um, which uh, is a great place to visit if ever you're in the in the area. Um, so I suppose there are a few more of um, British Schumacher's principles which we've taken on board through the way we have built our company. Um, we, um, for example, include um, in our factory um, on-site accommodation for our staff. We've got some 40 staff at our factory. Um, we have, in fact, a small farm on site as part of the compound where uh, we, of course, can solar irrigate our crops. And those crops uh, will uh, supply the canteen, uh, which makes exceptionally spicy food. If ever you visit there, um, I strongly recommend um, not, having the, uh, not having the big pot in the middle there, unless you want your head blown off. Um, here's a picture of our... Um, of our boardroom, which looks quite fancy. Um, it, it doesn't get used all that much, to be honest, but it's a nice illustration of the kind of multicultural nature of our company. And that's kind of interesting for us because we have some quite conservative Hindus, um, uh, as uh, unsurprisingly, as, for those who know that uh, area of, of India, uh, mixing with fairly liberal Westerners like us. Um, and, and so, um, but we all, treat each other with uh, lots of respect and uh, tolerance and, and quite a lot of patience and we um, it all works very well actually um, it gives a flavor of um, of how we run that uh, side of the company um, there's a there's a, a chapter I think it's chapter 18 in the book that, that talks uh, where he talks about ownership um, and one of the things that we've done uh, with the ownership of our company is make sure that all staff um, have a very generous share option scheme um, in the in, in future pump um, right down to um, well, anyone who anyone who wanted to participate really uh, from India and in the UK um, and we've also done a crowd fund 
um, to raise a bit more money a couple of years ago. And, and in that case, some of our actual farmers and distributors in places like Kenya and Malawi actually were unable to buy into the company. So it is it does feel like a kind of a family concern rather than a, um, a hard hard nosed financial outfit um, as, uh, such as my prior experience in my last company was. Um, just a few pictures here about how basic our pump is, and this is on the assembly line, uh, how it all fits together, really designed that the farmer themselves can, um, can repair um, and, and service the pump uh, very easily. We provide spare parts and tools in every box, as well as instructional videos on YouTube so that the farmers themselves can be empowered to keep those pumps running. Um, we do make sure that all pumps are very well tested. Um, uh, Schumacher talks in the book about, you know, um, sort of rough and ready technologies as opposed to really precise uh, tolerances in manufacturing. But we found that precision is pretty important if you want it to be reliable. Um, and here is a here is a machine that he might not like very much, a, a pretty high tech um, vertical lathe machine, uh, but that does enable us to maintain our quality control and keep our costs down. So uh, I'm just going to now finish uh, by showing you one more picture of some happy farmers holding huge cabbages, actually. Um, and um, thank you very much for your attention. I would really look forward to hearing questions and debate following that. Thanks very much. Toby, thank you very much. And thank you to all our panelists. Um, we're, we're, the, next, the next part of this um, is entitled The Conversation Between Panelists. So I hope we can get some conversation going. So, I think if we could start off by the panelists all unmuting themselves, that'd be a good start. Um, I, I'm going to sort of try and start off. We're, I think, between the three of you, there's this, there's a theme of perhaps technology and food production and intermediate technology and food production. So perhaps we could start there. And I, I'm wondering whether uh, you've got different viewpoints. Some about. Um, even as far as AI, some actually the basic technology, some about the markets and the systems around it. But I'm wondering how whether whether your reflection on what you've experienced in your work is that we actually whether the work you're doing can exist within the current world economic paradigm and system, or whether and and, and can create a flourishing world in that or whether actually we need a syst an entire system change so is there hope that um the the, the it, what you've been talking about can gently change things or do we actually need a revolution um john as you spoke first and have been quiet the longest would you like to start and then the others please chip in yeah that's quite a quite a big question um i think I think technology is just technology. I, th I think one thing that is, is coming across um, is that um, <clears throat> and a lot of the impact of technology depends on how it's used. So, I mean, I, I spoke very positively about um, solar power irrigation. So we just spoke very positively about it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily that doesn't necessarily lead to, to positive outcomes. It can it can be something that actually is used to drive unsustainable agriculture. So Sebastian, you were talking about the dominant um, economic paradigm that, that we're in. So for the last 50 years, um, there's been a big push for commercial intensive agriculture, heavily dependent on, on chemicals. So if, if, if something like uh, solar pumps are introduced into that paradigm, they can actually be used to support um, more intensification. Um, so in, in practice, what that means is more harvests uh, on particular areas of land than, with, than they were before, um, which is great from a farmer perspective. And, and as we said, it can help farmers cope with unreliable rainfall. But if the nutrients, you know, extra nutrients and organic matter have been taken out of, out of the soil as a result of the increased number of production cycles that are taking place, if, that, if those nutrients and organic matter are replaced, then of course it leads to uh, degradation of the soil and environment, environmental degradation. Likewise, there also can be a problem with um, with water use you know ironically um ironically if you have a diesel pump um if you pump for 10 hours as opposed to one hour it, it costs you 10 times more than it would for a solar pump so what that means is you're incentivized to be really really efficient with your with your with your pump 
with the solar pump you don't have that incentive because if you pump for 10 hours it's cost the same as if you pump for one hour so there's a danger of over use of water resources now i'm not reversing what i said before and suddenly saying that solar pumping is a bad thing but it has to take place within the context that is all rec recognizes uh, the need for a regenerative agricultural system if it doesn't it will drive uh, unsustainable agriculture uh, uh, environmental degradation um i don't think that really quite answers your your question does it toby it just points to this complexity so there is a need for the system to be um more regenerative and for regenerative agriculture to, to be incentivized otherwise this technology technology could um could have a negative outcome um i would i would Go jump on. in and oh yeah i would just jump in and say it 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 already has and will uh and so that's sort of where i it, you know if if it if it isn't actually controlled or we take agency of it it will absolutely run in the wrong direction we've already seen that so i think that's sort of one way to think about it is it's it's almost a defensive to say these are powerful tools uh that need to be uh put into uh control and into governance structures that are actually serving and moving in the uh, in the in the direction towards regeneration and support of cooperatives and collaboratives that are actually going to yield the result. Of, you know, be sort of instead of autonomous technology, we have technology autonomy, right? We have more control over the tools that we use, and I think that's really for for me that's really sort of one of the driving pieces is can we use this this inc incredible sort of uh, shared understanding of tools and technologies and uh and create artifacts that represent our values from that not just you know the, the and governance organizations that are actually going to provide some accountability for the power that we've we we have created that the genie's out of the bottle there for some you know in in some sense so how do we harness that uh, towards regenerative ends, and, and, I, and I think the example of the solar pump is a really good one. You can draw down aquifers with a really good solar pump, just as as you can, or you, you can use it for really targeted drip irrigation, uh, or you know, it's really. And, and then, from from my perspective, using the tools that are observing our environment and accelerating our understanding of shared knowledge for what are the things that work best, and viewing the potential and sharing the potential that. We can be beneficial organisms uh, and think of like the good Anthropocene, <laughs> like what are the ways in which we can, uh, you know, position ourselves uh, and values with that technology, uh, I, I think, and, and to, from that extent, that's sort of the hopeful side, uh, because again, the tools are there, uh, how can we Transcend them, I, I think, is what I'd like. To, you know, th that's my goal. Is like, how do we transcend what we have now to where we can? Uh, it becomes cultural knowledge, and you don't have to look at a screen or you don't have to access the internet. It's part of your fabric. It's part of your recipes. It's part of, you know, what your neighbor is doing. Um, but in the meantime, we have a tremendous amount to learn. You know, we often, especially regenerative farmer farming, you may have somebody you know, a continent away that's doing something far more relevant than your neighbor. And so how do we sort of accelerate that process and deeper connection um, uh, to help So, Toby. Yeah, and I, I would just chip in. I mean, John, John is absolutely spot on. You know, you're, with solar irrigation, we are decoupling the, co the, the, the marginal cost of pumping water um, from, from, from using gasoline. Um, and I, I think in our experience, and we've done quite a lot of work with the International Water Management Institute to try and address this kind of elephant in the corner for our company. Um, and what we what we believe, um, which is very much in tune with what we're talking about here today, is that by keeping it small, you're reducing the the, the potential um, for, for impact. And you know, we live in a, a pretty messy world, um, but I don't think there is a lot of hope of that the International Water Management Institute are going to be able to put in place water governance policies across all of Africa, right? It's just not going to happen. But um, one of the nice things about, well, one of the bad things about uh, sunshine is that it's very dilute. Um, and one of the amazing things about fossil fuel is it's really, really concentrated. So a litre of gasoline will pump a lot of water. Um, if you want to pump that same amount of water, you need a lot of solar panels. And that is going to 
be fairly cumbersome and fairly expensive. And so our technologies like ours that do keep things small inherently are supporting smaller scale farmers rather than large industrialized farmers with lots of capital at their disposal who could drain an aquifer by, by putting in great big you know, scaled up systems. So by keeping things small, um, perhaps we stand a better chance of doing things in a, in a sustainable way. Or at least, yeah, or at least operating at a much slower rate. Could I? Could we just um, talk a little bit, Dawn, um, about you? You, 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 you said a lot of things when you were speaking, and I, <laughs> I confess that about fifty percent of it, um, I, I was my small brain was able to take in. But I'm just intrigued about um, this, this sort of global knowledge local action and and how that really manifests itself is it is it global knowledge for the developing world or is it global knowledge for the developed world and have you are you seeing that actually happen going back to toby's point of yeah. impact as opposed to theory in in the world we're in today yeah, I mean, agriculture is such a unique case because, you know, that global knowledge about the way uh, the, uh, the way the natural ecosystem works is 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 common in terms of the, the way, uh, you know, plants function and soil is created and harnessing uh, our understanding of the way in which uh, legumes uh, are able to capture nitrogen and translate that into proteins and into the, into the microbiome that builds soil. Those are sort of, that's sort of the global knowledge that can be applied anywhere. The specific case of what's going to grow well in your specific area is that local knowledge and adaptation. It doesn't mean that it's the only thing that's going to work in your area, uh, but it's, it's a, a way, it's uh, that way of translating our understanding of what actually works into, uh, into a local context. And so there's, so there's that tension especially when we're talking about, and I think where it comes into practice, and we've seen this in, in practice, uh, we have members that are, you know, that are, uh, you know, in every continent who are actively working not only on uh, tools, but also on uh, cropping plans and other types of technology. Um, but the, we've seen this tension with uh, food sovereignty and local community sovereignty around uh, specific species or varieties. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have the, the tension there, I think, with, uh, you know, uh, um, with attribution or, uh, um, uh, you know, essentially what, what is, what is acceptable to share as part of that global commons and what is really part of your identity and really needs to be part of your security and autonomy uh, as, as an individual and as a community. So that's absolutely in, in practice. And we are seeing, again, the, the, the process and that tension play out uh, in, in, in real time, not only in the tools that we're using, but I think you can find patterns of that uh, more, more broadly uh, with their ability to communicate uh, globally, um, and again, that's not new. Even with electronic communication, this has been happening, you know, you know, throughout history, <laughs> uh, just in different forms. Um, John, but I you, oh, I was just gonna, I was just gonna yeah. add the other, the other key piece there that I wanted to emphasize was that when you is the emphasis on on that on that scale, uh, and that. The, the, the sort of the global infrastructure and shared infrastructure to share that is at tension with the ability to use it to actually create smaller scale appropriate tools and our ability to really adapt uh, those and, and actually reduce the economies of scale necessary to build things because we have access to the, to the uh, infra, uh, uh, to, uh, knowledge and, and better access to markets and so forth. So there are ways in which tech can actually really drive down the economies of scale um, but it has this tension of using sort of this uh, the uh, global infrastructure, which we that's a that's another task to to tackle. How do we create a governance structure to support that? But go ahead, sorry, Toby. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point because um, we found. I mean, we are basically a, a company that totally relies on globalization, right? We we manufacture in, uh, in in one part of the world and then we distribute to 
25 or 30 other, country, other countries from there you know, via shipping container. Um, we had a really interesting time during the, the COVID pandemic because suddenly some of those, those pieces of the globalization infrastructure started to fall apart and suddenly we couldn't get steel or we couldn't get a certain type of plastic and we couldn't get a, a, a shipping container at a reasonable price or actually at all sometimes. And so there was a moment when we felt very vulnerable that because we had centralized everything for I think reasonably rational reasons that actually suddenly we, we, we sort of assumed that the, the global world order was going to continue as, as we've known it for our, you know, our lifetimes. And, and we got a glimpse of what might happen if it didn't. And we want, we, as a company, we are, I'm very aware, we're still not very resilient um, to those kinds of big shocks and well, nor many things, um, I guess. And has, Toby, has that, has that changed? Have you changed your business at all as a result or have you just gone back and sort of held your breath? <laughs> I'm afraid it's more the latter actually, because I, I, don't, I don't think we could contemplate trying to to, to devolve manufacturing to so many different um, emerging economy markets. Um, as I mentioned before, we tried it earlier, uh, some years back, and it was a huge headache. But we might get to the point where perhaps we could do assembly in, in a few strategic locations. And so that would have some benefits that, that there would be more local technical knowledge on, on some of the makeup of our products. You could say, well, there might be certain components that you could source locally that perhaps didn't require such precision or or, or, or that kind of thing. But for, I guess if you're a really large company, you could, you could start thinking about that. For, but for us, it's a bit of a killer to, to even you know, try and consider doing that. So going, going back to the, the original point um, about um, local knowledge and um, what Dawn was talking about, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, quite a bit of what we do is about elevating local knowledge. And as, as we were talking here, it kind of it occurred to me that, you know, there's a lot of interest now in what, what is called regenerative agriculture. And, and people use that in different ways, don't they? Um, there's a lot of um, greenwashing out there, but, there's, but there's, it's been talked about by just about, about everybody. Um, and in the context in we, we, which, which we work in Africa, I mean, a lot of traditional African agriculture is regenerative agriculture. I mean, you look at the practices that people are talking about, it's what traditionally used to happen on most farms uh, across Africa. It's just that the last 50 years, there's been this push for a different type of agriculture. And a lot of our knowledge hasn't been lost, but it's been flattened, if you like, and, and, and mm. not under the surface. It, it's been deprioritized. It's been, uh, people have been told that that's not important knowledge. But perhaps now, as the, the conversations about regenerative ag agriculture kind of pick up, perhaps that's an opportunity to... Um, uh, to kind of re-elevate that knowledge and, 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 and revitalize it. And we do see some of that happening. Um, in Zimbabwe, there's a, a form of conservation agriculture called, and I'll get the pronunciation wrong, it's Pufavumza, I think. And it's a form of conservation agriculture that's particularly good uh, with growing maize and it, it supports resilience and, uh, and uh, uh, much, high, much higher yields. Practical Action, along with number, a number of organizations, were promoting this. Um, and we sat on the, uh, one of the government steering committees for their new agricultural policy, and the government ended up um, uh, putting it, into, put it into, into the national agricultural policy and promoting it to the extent that it's led to, I think, 1.8 million families starting to adopt this. So that was really an example of a, a traditional, traditional knowledge that was elevated up, put into government policy, and and was uh, was disseminated. And I wonder if. Uh, the focus on regenerative agriculture gives more and more opportunities um, uh, to do that. And I think Dawn meant, spoke about the, the kind of role of, of modern technology in, in helping um, share knowledge and, and what have you. I think there's also, so one of the programs I spoke about before in Senegal, um, the one using radio. So that program also includes um, opportunities for farmers to phone in, uh, to feed back. So actually information is going back the other way and that then they're, they're then influencing the content of the future advisory services and the messages that, that come back down. So you're starting to have a more kind of circular democratic um, learning and uh, information provision uh, service. But is, is this um, 
I, I just sorry to uh, just to keep going on the technology as in digital technology question. Uh, you know the 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 quantum of um, I, I, I don't know if if Schumacher would have said it's sort of um, destructive technology or not, but the quantum of technology required to for the world to communicate. And you're all saying that there is this role for essentially digital communication in the development of localized technology for better livelihoods. Is 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 the is the latter is the impact good enough? Uh, is it big enough for 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 the investment of the former? If that makes sense. Or, or are we to, or are we talking? big theory here about wonderful sharing of information and actually people are getting poorer and the world's getting hotter. Stunned silence. Uh, I, well, I would, I, I guess I, I would say we're already in that world. Uh, it's, it's, it's happened. And so we can now, and so my question is, how do we, how do we, control it so that we can reduce harm but ideally uh, uh take take some agency over it and that is being happened there are examples of it and and, and that's what the open you know uh, creating software that is accessible uh to populations globally uh the you know you can get an incredible you know a five dollar linux computer uh is able to store information to translate all basically all knowledge on earth you know on a th on a thumb drive so how do we then harness that in a way that's actually we're in control of what that's doing and be able to bridge languages and uh and knowledge exchange so that's the that's the question and it is happening there are examples that is exactly what we're we're doing is uh sharing the part that's the commonwealth of knowledge but the the trick that i see is is really or the focus is really how do we assure uh sovereignty and autonomy and recognizing that it isn't just producers this is something that is cult, you know broader it's the responsibility of everybody in in the community uh in terms of taking uh, control and producers are one way in which or you know farmers and ranchers are one way in which that's manifest but that's uh, sort of a reflection of what we're able to accomplish together anything i'll say on this is that um as you've been aware from what i've been saying i don't believe in silver bullets so i don't believe that um this sort of technology or any sort of technology is, is a silver bullet i think that as dawn was saying it, it's out there um it's one tool that can be used amongst many others um, and I think sometimes it, it, it doesn't necessarily need some new complicated app or platform all the time. Sometimes, you know, it's just a WhatsApp group, a WhatsApp group that suddenly connects mm -hmm. farmers to markets. It's suddenly, you know, it's suddenly that, that's transformed things. Suddenly a, 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 pult, a, a chicken producer can send a message on WhatsApp and straight away he's got someone lining up to buy, um, buy the produce. Whereas before, they would have had to walk out onto the road and wait several days before mm -hmm. they could everything so you know i think there's things like that don't actually require significant investment and and that technology is there already in the communities in which we work yeah, yeah, some of it's sort of social technology oh, just to build on the market example that's something we're familiar with just in our own farm but it's replicated elsewhere we're we're able to connect directly with restaurants hospitals schools neighborhoods for orders directly to a collaborative of farms and it allowed uh, to both coordinate on pricing, it allowed for the sophistication in terms of packing and delivery, similar to what Amazon has, but it's on a very, very low cost uh, technology um, that allows for, uh, you could create a, a sophisticated marketplace that wouldn't, uh, that would be very difficult for us to coordinate otherwise. But, Maybe, yeah, yeah. Uh, only that, yeah, we, we've seen a lot of this, this sort of informal, um, these inform, informal networks self self-organizing in, in particular in places like kenya and nigeria um you know facebook is pretty ubiquitous like it or not um and you know there are groups on facebook called things like tomato and onion farmers of western kenya with you know a million people on them amazing, um, amazing. and and you know photos of yeah i've got you know 
two tons of this variety so this many shillings you know who's buying um and and you know it, it, it may be a different platform in five years time or 10 years time it may maybe you know a new a, a new successor social network of some kind but people are very very um you know self-organizing when it comes to those kinds of things they'll use what tools are are available um it's, it's hard to imagine what those ones in the future might be and that that kind of gives me hope for the resilience that we need because i think within you know the not too distant future within all of our lifetimes we should expect some pretty serious um climate change induced shocks um of various kinds to you know the world we know and the the security that we know and um certainly the agricultural systems that we depend on and so the more that we can have this sort of atomistic localized resilience where people will recalibrate and reorganize uh, a local network um just as you you know you might have delivered vegetables to your groceries to your vulnerable neighbor um during during the, the pandemic you know, humans are incredibly capable of, of of doing the right thing in these kinds of, of reorganizing in these kinds of situations and we should be planning for that um in in the way we design what we're doing now can i can i just i want to ask some questions about i i i'm i don't know if john meant uh, my description of his word systems but i want to talk about systems and i i'm sort of in my simple mind there are there are I mean, there's probably multiple areas to talk about here, but I'm going to simplify it and say there's one area which is, um, uh, let's say, lifting people out of poverty and giving them local livelihoods to eat and to have some money and to develop themselves. And then there's the mega agri systems that are completely destructive that are supporting, um, let's call it the developed world or the Western world or whatever we want to call it. And I'm I'm I can I can see in my mind a, a lot of what's been talked about helping the former um but I, I i i worry on a personal level that the latter doesn't get impacted and i heard um a, a, a friend of mine was telling me a, a story the other day about one of the largest almond producers in america having a problem with its yield um and realizing that it was basically due to um, environmental degradation because of farming practices because the farmers were being screwed on price and so they went in and did a cost plus model cut out the the um the agents in between um and it's been transformative um, and i wonder with toby say your solar water pump or other technology whether there are examples of large numbers of small farm holders enabled by convivial technologies that have somehow maybe grouped together in, in in some way and are actually enabling the destructive food systems that we've got in the in the in the western world from being less destructive and i'm just wondering if there's any 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 hopeful yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we can see it in our sales patterns. Um, for most of our company's history, we've sold exclusively to Southern Africa and Southeast Asia. Right. Um, about ten percent of our sales now, um, since the since the pandemic, are to Europe and North America. Right. Um, and those are the people that are buying them are generally people who are practicing Regen Ag, uh, like Dawn. Uh, on a, often a fairly small scale, I and mean, you might call them market gardens rather than gardeners rather than farmers. Um, you know, a few acres. Um, we've got people that are doing um, CSA or veg box schemes. You know, their local community um, using who are off grid or don't want to use um, you know gasoline for that. So uh, I see I see real real optimism in its very early days, yeah. but in, in a reconfiguration of our food into a more localized model that's more resilient. Yeah, I can provide another specific example. We One of our open team members uh, is uh, Terragenesis International, and they're working directly with some of the uh, 
uh, apparel and food companies uh, for sourcing regenerative products. Uh, and in one particular example is working with a, a rubber producer cooperatives in Indonesia uh, that are going into the soles and vans shoes. Um, and the, the agreement there is really looking at, uh, at, at providing additional sources of income, not just for the rubber, but for the environmental benefits that uh, those farms are creating and quantifying it. But in order to, so they're sort of the, the value of the environmental data itself becomes a product that's being produced by the farm. And so that's an example that's current right now that is uh, that has substantial additional income streams for, for that group of farms. And I think that's one of the the conversations is sort of decommodifying or creating these place-based values uh, for all agriculture that has been, you know, commodification is sort of homogenized that and we have, of course, the externalities, but how do we like create those invisible, how do we quantify and communicate those stories uh, that have value to uh, customers, both locally, but also globally, uh, and that transforms some of the potential income because it is clearly creating a public value, um, but uh, being able to be able to exchange that and communicate it effectively, um, I think is, is a part of the, the promise and also reality. Um, transactions are being made on that now. Wonderful. Just to, just to come, just to add another element, is there an element here also related to consumer demand and the potential of that to kind of drive change? And so we're doing some interesting research at the moment in Kenya and Uganda, looking at um, markets for regenerative agricultural produce, um, including looking at consumer demand. And one of the tentative things coming out of that research is that even in local markets, and even where products aren't certified, but where where local people know that the, the food is coming from producers who are producing less intensively with less chemicals and what have you, those products are sold, are bought much more quickly. They're not, they don't necessarily pay a premium because this is local markets, this is people on generally low incomes, but that food gets sold much, more, much quicker. So even in those markets, I mean, you tend to think about organic markets as being, you know, the certified produce in the, in the supermarket in, in the city, but even in these local markets and rural areas, actually there's a preference for that type of uh, produce now because awareness mm. of the impacts of industrial agriculture uh, in, in Kenya are now quite, quite high. Um, so you're starting to see some consumer pressure there as well. Super. Look, guys, we're, we're, we're running low on time. I've just, my timekeeping isn't very good. Um, and so we're, I'm now going to invite each of you to give some closing rep remarks um, and hopefully keep the sort of positive tone that we've ended with <laughs> um, um, Dawn, would you like to go first? Sure, happy to. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what we're seeing here is the, you know, again, continued relevance of Schumacher's uh, vision for independence and our ability to potentially deliver that to more people globally and in an environment where things are getting uh, worse and worse and better and better, faster and faster. So how do we, I think we really have this opportunity uh, and really imperative to take control, not just of the climate, but of the forces that are really uh, moving us involuntarily in a direction uh, that is, is counterproductive. Um, so I, I think that's, that's my theme is that it's a, it's a hopeful one, but it really does take, it requires taking action of things that I, I think, and governance, I think not from uh, nation state governance, but cooperative governance of some of the core infrastructure uh, that uh, is so influential in our technology uh, uh, environment right now. Thank you. John. Um, uh, first of all, uh, participating in this discussion, preparing for it has encouraged me to look at Schumacher again, and that's been uh, really kind of energizing, going back and seeing how it's relevant and, and seeing how radical it sounds even now. But I also just recently I was listening to one of the many podcasts featuring Kate Rayworth and Donut Economics, and you see the direct link from, you know, it's basically uh, small is beautiful reinterpreted uh, in the modern world and, and gaining, gaining traction in a number of different places. So um, it really remains uh, highly relevant uh, to the world we're in today. And this process, participating in this has really, really kind of reiterated that, that to me. Um, I think that a couple of things that are coming out from, from this discussion um, are, 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 are first to this point that there's no silver bullets. There are 
all these other systemic issues that need to be resolved technology on its own is in a lot of technology is neither good or bad it depends on the context in which it is used and how, how, it, how it is used um whether it's appropriate technology or, or it's modern technology um and the other really significant thing for me coming out is, is the importance of connection um and that across uh, different organizations and across the world but also elevating you know local knowledge about agriculture and about climate change and about adaptation and ensuring that that is that is shared and that is influencing others but also shared um, so that others um, can benefit from that learning thank you very much toby over to you um thanks um and thanks for the opportunity to speak today i i, I um interesting that john mentioned kate rayworth there because i've, I've been uh, i think i listened to that same podcast recently and, and, and read the book and i noticed one of the um the Q and A uh, questions talked about community wealth building, which um, is essentially the idea of keeping money within local communities and building those localized uh, connections uh, counter to, you know, what the kind of trickle down globalization um, sort of uh, mantra would 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 preach. Um, from from our side of things, I mean, as I said earlier, I, I do think there's a pretty uncertain world ahead of us. Um, but through the knowledge sharing that that, that, that we've talked about, that Dawn's, uh, Dawn's particularly talked about um, so compellingly today, you know, I think we are able to equip ourselves with the resilience that we need. Um, I think that complexity of everything is is an increasing problem for for, for surviving that. Um, you know, if those global supply chains break down, are you going to be able to get the spare part? Um, and and how are you going to manage um, to, to 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 reconfigure your your, your local agriculture? So, um, in our world, um, something my father said to me when I was growing up was uh, often was keep it simple, stupid. Um, and um, I <laughs> I think that's what we need to do more of um, if we are to um, to push forward a small scale appropriate technology um, in a positive way. Thank you very much. Um, some quick words uh, before I sum up, uh, before I end, sorry, uh, about our next panel conversation, which will take place on Thursday, August the 17th. Please mark it in your diaries around the theme of instituting universal basic income, meeting needs unconditionally. Uh, please be on the lookout for further information and registration details through the Schumacher Center's e newsletter and social media. That is a good one. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dawn. And thank you, Toby. Um, thank you to those of you who posed questions. I did try and work them in. I know it sounded like I was just making them all up, but it wasn't. It was you guys. And thank you to the Schumacher Centre staff, particularly David tonight, for organising. And thank you all very much for uh, attending. And good morning, good evening, and good day, and good night.